thank you very, very much indeed for agreeing to join me um, this afternoon and this morning simultaneously um, for a discussion about Gerhard Richter um, and the exhibition that is on at the Met Breuer called Painting After All. And I just wanted to dive in with a very simple question, which is, when did you become aware of Gerhard's work? And is his a practice that you followed closely at all, or was he just part of the landscape? Thank you so much for having me. Um, it's been wonderful to spend time um, immersed in looking at reproductions of Richter's work. I should say, um, unfortunately, it, you know, the show closed so quickly after opening um, that I haven't had time to really spend time in the exhibition. Although, as you know, luckily I went to the opening. I so often don't go to openings and I'm so relieved that I did go because otherwise I probably wouldn't have got up there in that first week. Um, and what an amazingly beautiful, extraordinary show it is. Um, but anyway, thank you so much for asking me. Um, very happy to be here. And, um, I think I first remember seeing Richter's paintings in London, probably at Anthony Doffé Gallery in the 80s. Um, so, but I was certainly aware of him when I was a student in the late 80s, early 90s in England. Um, but I think I was fairly slow to realizing how huge he was and is, and how, um, you know, in a way that I've seen um, the work over time, I think, because there's such a broad range within the work, I feel like different works perhaps speak to one at different times. Um, and, you know, you sort of can't ignore Richter, can you? All right. So, <laughs> that is a perfect segue to um, my next question, which begins with a kind of musing, I guess, which is, you know, when considering your and Richter's work, one of the things that strikes me is a shared kinship for the possibilities of paint as an expressive and analytical medium, and also because of your both very deep, sensuous affinity for the stuff of paint. I um, was reading very recently an interview that you did four years ago when you said, quote, when I reach for the right color at exactly the right moment, that's when I know it's going well. Guston said it beautifully. He said it's painting itself. And so in respect of this, the subtitle of the Richter exhibition is, is called, um, is, is painting after all. It's actually a phrase that he came up with for the show. How do you understand that phrase, painting after all? And would you agree with that kind of proposition? I think it's tricky to ask a painter how they feel about painting after all, because, you know, I, of course, do paint almost every day of my life. So obviously there's some kind of um, I'm, belief, I suppose, that it's worth it. So part of me always shirks a little bit from anything that, and I just use the word belief, but this idea that one believes in painting or is committed to painting or that, you know, it's a, it's a choice, you know, that I think it's very tricky to talk about to sound like you chose painting and then does that mean you rejected everything else? Because I've, you know, always been wide open to every other medium and form of contemporary art and in fact, probably respond more to other mediums than I do to most contemporary painting. And yet, I'm a painter. Um, and I didn't think out of any, you know, I didn't become a painter because I felt that painting had work to do still in a conscious way. It was more that, well, the helpless gesture, the, um, that was kind of all I could do. And, but maybe I'm being disingenuous and the older I get and the more I think about it, there is a sort of belief that painting can save the day. <laughs> that painting, well, of course, st still has more to say. And it's really the people like Richter that have shown, you know, as everything narrowed down and one felt that well, painting really doesn't have much work left to do, you know, has it all been done? Has it all been said? Which of course, every young painter asks himself. 
Um, I, I wanted to go on because you, you evoked and brought up the situation in London in the 90s with the YBAs, the Young British Artists, and that moment where painting was, you know, ostracized, really. Um, and every piece of writing about you um, includes mention of your British origins, even if you have lived here for your entire professional life, pretty much, nearly 30 years. So I do not want to dwell particularly on this today, but what I do want to do is to draw your attention to a pair of what I found rather surprising paintings by Richter in the exhibition um, of the two artists, British artists, um, an older generation than the YBAs of Gilbert and George, mm. with, with whom Richter had a friendship um, in the 70s, and these are from 1975. There's a secret to understanding how these have been composed. But you've, you've mentioned that along with the so-called YBAs, you are all collectively the children of both Gilbert and George and also Bacon, but that you have got a bit more, quote, Turner thrown in. <laughs> and I wanted to ask, first of all, two questions. One is, how do you interpret Richter's portrait of G&G? &G? And then if you wouldn't mind expanding a little bit more about the comment on Turner. They're such interesting paintings, the Gilbert and George. Um, they really leap out at you, don't they? They're sort of standalone in a way. In one way, because they're such recognizable portraits. And I'd, you know, in most of his family pictures, as Bryony Fur, is it Fur? Mm -hmm. But it, you know, the way that the family picture has this sort of, um, weight of a kind of collective memory of just any picture. Um, whereas the Gilbert and George are so utterly specific. In a way, they're the only ones I'd really call portraits. Um, physically, I mean, uh, formally, they actually remind me of um, Francis Bacon sort of meet Sickert and um, almost, I kept thinking of Sickert, Manet and Bacon while I was looking through um, the, the, especially the figurative paintings, of course. Why Sickert? Sickert. Because um, this, the use of the photograph, I suppose, I always think of Sickert as the English digger in that, you know, the way there's a sense of the uh, composition, there's a sort of uncanniness that in the negative space. Or, and I think that very much comes from working from photographs. And, you know, when you take a photograph, there are often things that you can't quite explain in them, but because it's a photograph, you know it, is something real or was something real at the moment of the photograph. But you know, I often think photography is better than painting at capturing that sort of uncanny sense of not quite knowing what something is, but fully um, taking it on and understanding it. In a way of something that I think is very important for a painter um, to present something as if it were a fact, whether you actually know what it is or not. And a sort of long-winded way, I'm saying, for example, I've been copying a lot of Dutch still lives recently, Snyder's, and um, I really enjoy, and this happened as well when I was copying Paradise Old Master paintings, and I was starting to need reading glasses, but sometimes I'd draw without glasses and copy, and I rather love the sense when you're copying something, and even though you're the one looking and drawing, you're not quite sure what you're drawing yet. So it's a very sort of pure way of getting under the skin of a painting, but that you're sort of discovering the form while you draw. For example, a cauliflower. I've been drawing this, you know, I've been drawing this extraordinary thing, copying this sort of smudgy reproduction of a Snyder's painting. And mm -hmm. it's only after drawing it for five minutes, thinking it's this sort of terrifying face or like grotesque. Um, like Archimboldo. And I realized I was just a poor cauliflower. Or, mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I think, and I think that's something that often occurs in photographs. And when you think of Richter and the way that he uses smudges and blurs and all the things that are, you know, sort of thought of as the faults of photography, but that's sort of, that's sort of the moment where they become paintings in a way. But and Turner, where does, where's, where's the Turner? Are we talking about romanticism here? Are we talking about a sort of abstraction or 
just the earliness of how abstract it is. Um, just, they're so daring. They're so, you know, he almost completely lets go of the image, as it were. Um, which, of course, is a space, a place I'm very interested in, is where sort of image becomes painting or, you know, where, when, when can you let the image go? Um, and, but with, for me, with Turner, I suppose there is always, or not just for me, I think with Turner, there's always a sense of place um, that you're never in a fully imaginary realm. You definitely feel that you're in a def definite place. And I think that's really important to me. Um, and one way, one reason why I never really think I'm an abstract artist. You and I talked a little bit at the very beginning of the Breuer's life um, under the auspices of the Met around an exhibition called Unfinished, in which there was an entire room or gallery full of Turner watercolours that were found in his studio following his death. Um, and at the same time, to your point, you know, he, there he was sort of sitting, um, working simultaneously on a lot of, of different paintings. Um, and I still, you know, the, the, the jury is still out as to whether or not he completed those paintings. But, you know, you are, you, you reference a lot of um, works. Um, from art history, such as Rubens, you mentioned a number, Delacroix, Jericho, Degas, Bruegel, <clears throat> Bruegel Bosch, um, Cezanne, and Richter too has looked to history. Um, sometimes quite like um, directly actually, um, such as an enunciation that he did by Titian, um, he, he sort of, um, uh, passed it out into sort of three different versions, four different versions, where he was experimenting with the way that Rick, that um, Titian had had um, created his enunciation. It's not in the show, but it is also arguable that he draws on the palette of Titian in paintings like Betty, for instance, um, the little painting of one of his daughters. Um, who is rendered in these beautiful colours that when you look very closely at them are this um, combination of very similar kind of tonal values. And he also refers indirectly to Vermeer through his um, portrait of Ella or German Romantic paintings such as Caspar David Friedrich in Ice, um, which is our sort of key signature image. So as an artist who's keenly studied the work of so-called old masters in your own practice, how, how do you understand, how do you sympathize with or empathize with Richter's own approach to the European painting tradition? I mean, I'm glad you say so-called old masters because I've never really liked, I've never really agreed with the idea that they're old <laughs> in that, you know, in a way the whole point of a painting is that it exists in the present. Um, and I think that I just always felt I had a very direct relationship to art, whether it was, you know, made now or, you know, in the 15th century or whatever. And I suspect that Richter feels the same. I mean, I think probably most painters feel that in a way. I mean, isn't that what makes one painting stand out more than another when you go to a great museum and you're drawn to one thing and, you know, it's, it's speaking to you in the moment, um, not to sound too hokey, but, you know, I really, if there's any belief in my <laughs> attitude towards painting, it really is about other people's paintings and that they carry on resonating, you know, continuously and continually. And that they're ever, I think the sense of being forever in the moment is really something um, that I've been thinking about a lot recently about why a painting has or can have power, um, that it really yes. does sort of steal a moment out of time and not so much freezes it, but holds it, you know, in a sort of... I was actually talking about Guston and looking at Guston a lot recently too, and there are funny, um, funny comparisons between Guston and Richter, really, thinking about both of them. Um, not obviously just the extreme abstraction and figuration, but... Um, 
Mm, the point. sense of something. I was thinking about Guston and um, say the early abstract paintings that they sort of in this sense of unfurling as you watch them that you almost have this sense of seeing something be made. Um, and I don't know if it's because I'm in nature a lot at the moment, but sort of thinking it's rather like watching a flower open or something and that, but it is frozen. And the fact that a painting can have movement, I think more than a photograph, that the paint itself gives a certain internal movement. I guess the fracture of the painting, the trapped energy that really makes it up is um, the, so you're talking about two types of sort of temporal or time. One, one is the presentness of painting whenever it is painted. Yeah. I mean, it, it's the, it's, you know, the now, the, the, the liveness of painting, even if it was painted in 1753, yes. it is still present now. And then the other thing you're, think, you're talking about, I think a little is, this kind of unfurling in time, literally in the moment where you are understanding this kind of almost compression of time in, in looking at a painting such as an early Guston. And I, I'm, you mentioned Bionifer earlier and I just wanted to um, ask you about another uh, series of um, paintings by Richter um, that complicates that issue of time because I think it's I'm, I'm so interested to hear what you're saying but um, I was wondering how you respond to Richter's approach to the figure you know um, um, like you know Sabina Mitkint this this series of um, four where you have the just born human you've got the original myth of origin um, and it comes into being literally in his paintings only to begin to vanish and fade, you know, across the striations of the surface. I mean, he's, he's, he's almost enumerating this temporal slip um, in the picture itself. I get that hugely from your own paintings. And I just wondered if you could talk a little bit more about this, your thoughts about how your paintings literally embed time within them. Talk about a universal image. I mean, could there be anyone who doesn't relate to that image? So it's a very brilliant image in a way of the fact that it's going to speak to everyone for, you know, about, you know, whether they identify with the mother or child, but it's, I don't know, I feel like it's almost just a, a trick. <laughs> I don't know. What, what Richter's is a trick. Yeah. Yes. Well, it is, I think, because you see this very familiar image that could be you or it could be your mother. It could be you as a mother or you as a child or someone else in your family. But it, it very quickly becomes generic, doesn't it? So it's kind of like the extreme personal and intimate at the same time as, in a way, there's no more generic image than the mother and child. I don't know. I think there's something almost, it, it's almost neutral at the same time that it's so powerful and personal but in a way that I think helps one slip into more thinking about what does it mean to ha make, make a painting that is based so completely on a photograph or that imitates a photograph or has this overt relationship with photography. But in this series that, it, that are in the exhibition, I think what's interesting about them is that he, um, and I, I, I'm interested in your word, you know, it's a trick or, the, the, the trickiness of this topic. And that is that he, you know, he, um, these are photographs of his own wife, Sabina, with um, one of their children as a baby. You know, so, so there's, a, there's, there's a hook that, that doesn't start with the intellect as, as it often does with, with Richter's work or with the actual stuff of the painting. This goes right to the subject matter. So he takes an enormous risk in engaging with the subject matter first because of its distracted quality. And then he goes, then he takes you back into mm -hmm. something else and confronts you with, with the reality of that image and the unreality of that image. And I guess, you know, I, my question to you would be, given what he's been doing here, which is actually quite complex and yes, it's tricky, 
is that something that you try to avoid in your own work? Is that something that you use as a, I mean, I know that you, you work in many different modes and, um, and you're constantly studying from um, the young masters. <laughs> but, you know, it, it, is that something that acts as a kind of warning to you or is it something that you would actually engage with? The trickiness. Mm. I mean, I think I engage with it. In a way, I'd say I've used the erotic in the same way, um, especially mm. early on. But in a way, I think that failed because with the erotic, people just tend to turn it into titillation. Um, so it's hard to talk, you know, maybe I was barking up the wrong tree. In fact, I'm trying to do it again now. So maybe as an older woman approaching this, I'll get further, you know, and get away from titillation. I don't mean it's a trick in a bad way. I think it's a very clever way of sort of tapping into something that, you know, universal. I, I think one thing about the time in these paintings, um, it really is this sense that they're past and future all together at the same time. I mean, I know you didn't see the exhibition in, in, with the kind of time and depth that you always you know, approach exhibitions with, but I don't know whether you noticed that at key moments in the show, we also explored Richter's intentional practice um, of um, producing prints of his work, um, which he sees as intimately related to his painting practice. And I was wondering how you understand this very self-referential, reiterative practice by Richter especially in relation to your own exploration of processes of digital reproduction in work like the Saboteur Four Times. And I'd love to hear a bit more about that and to whether you see that there's a correlation between the practice of you both or whether what you feel you're doing is actually quite distinct from that of Richter. I was thrilled that I'd got my Saboteur Four Times out into the world <laughs> before the Richter show because I think when people discover this technology, if they don't already know it, um, everyone's going to want to do it and use it. And um, I have been trying to employ it for the last couple of years, only um, I think pulled it off a couple of times so far. Um, in, and so Richter's use of this um, multiplication of imagery makes so much sense to me. Um, I mean, of course, it's not something a young artist is going to be able to afford. So, um, you know, there is a luxury element to it, which is the only thing about it that I, that sort of is off-putting. But I think it's, it just couldn't be more fascinating to me, the idea of reproducing your own work. In my case, I'm then working back into it. Um, but I feel, I feel it's arrogant of me to... Um, draw comparisons between myself, my work, and Richter's. Um, I do feel he's sort of one, you know, pretty much the best painter uh, alive. Um, and his whole career is so deeply impressive. Um, and, but I think he's a model of how an artist can be. Um, and this is another way that Guston made me think of him and vice versa. The freedom um, in the work of, and partly in the veering all the way from extremely figurative to some of the best abstract paintings of the, you know, of recent years or probably the last 50 years. Um, I think it's just such a tragedy the show is closed. I want to see what young artists think. You know, when a really great painting show opens, um, mm. oh, friends of my generation, you know, just sort of wish you were 21 coming to see this for the first time, because I think it's just gonna blow people away to see what painting can do and um, what a flat image can do and the power. And so few people have the ambition and um, very few people have any sort of grandeur and um, the sort of grandness of Richter's vision and that really comes across in the uh, in the in the exhibition, oh, um, I agree with that. But I I I want I want to push you on yeah. the kind of reiterative aspect because 
you said yourself that you you know you you relate very much to that practice what i would like to ask you um because i you know richter in a way the question um applies to him too but why would one do that how do you see that your own practice and that of richter enriches somehow that painterly dialogue between the origin and between the resolution and also i guess going back to your point about time and the compression or temporal compression of painting over time you know why do you do it i think it's a way of slowing things down um but to have a sort of generative image in a way it sort of makes more real um something that i've always done um which is I never work on just one thing. And when I start a painting, I can't start on just one, or it's not interesting to me. I'll start on three or four at once, usually with a very similar palette. Um, so it's almost like starting the same painting four times. Mm. Now, within an hour, you can even start them all the same way. Let's say you mix up two colors and lay them on the floor and start each painting with a wash of these colors. Within an hour, they've all already got very distinctive looks or personalities or however you like to put it. They're going in different directions from the beginning. Now, I've always sort of felt, what a pity that you can't sort of save that moment because that's almost where it all starts, this sort of very generative moment. And one's always very aware of the innumerable different ways a painting could go at that very early stage. So the way I've used it is, I've, in some cases, taken one of those early moments and then sent that off to the printers and had that printed four times on a canvas. So I have been able to hold the thought as it were and go back into it. Um, and then in a way you could keep on doing it because then you could carry on with the four, you know, in another four different ways and then trap it again. And I mean, you could really go on and on with this, but I think the reason it's so compelling is a, just because you can, and because, you know, why, if you could suddenly, it's almost like peeling away the layers, you know, of a, it's very similar in a way to what I've always done in printmaking. So one reason I've always loved making monotypes, and I know I've said this before, but it's that sort of peeling the onion of layers of a painting, because at the end of a day of painting, you know, I have lost whatever was there at the beginning of that day you know, whether it's concealed or removed, wiped away, you have lost it. It's not there anymore. So I suppose this way of trapping different moments or pinning down different moments gives the illusion at least of slowing things down. And one's very aware of how these things, these moments in painting slip away, um, never to be had again. You know, so it's a sort of grasping, holding on to and in a way being able to jump back in. Um, in another way, it, it's yet another way of sort of trying to have it all, I suppose. There's a greed in having 20 things. I mean, you, you have a very similar kind of approach, I think in some respects, although what you're describing is a little bit distinct from what I understand with just works in such, in such paintings like the Cage series. The way that Richter proceeds with his his paintings, which is very much about the, the fact that, you know, the, you have this system of chance, you, 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 know, you, you go with both the risks and the rewards of that kind of process. And, and then, but it's also where the painting itself has a role in that, you know, it sort of almost dictates the means of its making in some respect. And you've talked about that in the past too. So in a way, it's not throwing it away, it's kind of laying, layering it on. It's still, it's still embedded somehow there in the surface. Absolutely. And to go back to something you asked before about the abstraction and figuration, um, and that was something that's very different about the, my approach and Richter's approach is that he really does conceal an image. Um, you know, it, it was something figurative at the beginning um, when, and they, it builds up and up and up and to more levels of concealment in a way, even while um, 
sort of steadily becoming itself as an abstract painting. Whereas my paintings do tend to, I feel that there's more of a back and forth of whether they're going to be, I don't know, I don't have anything as clear as his more sort of photographic works. I mean, I think looking at these is going to perhaps change the way I work. Um, you know, it's always annoyed me when people think that, you know, treat my paintings as a sort of peep show. Um, but so I've always sort of insisted that I don't make a figurative painting that I then conceal. But having looked so much at the Richters, I feel that perhaps I should try doing it that way. Um, rather than when things get too abstract, always trying to pull the figure back into it. Um, I mean, I think Richter is someone who's, you know, shown the way that one doesn't have to pick sides, as it were. Like in the olden days, you couldn't really be abstract and figurative. I mean, of course, I mean, and it's back to everything is in relation to everything else. That's also what's so brilliant about, you know, you can do a small, beautiful, sweet mother and child because you've got a whopping great muscular abstraction going on at the same time. So there's a sort of, in a, a, a slipperiness um, or a refusal to be pinned down by m making so much different work. We haven't even touched on mirrors and, um, and so on. But I think, that Richter's given him, by there being such extreme sort of statements put out with the extreme, um, you know, the work being so different within itself. I, I think that one of the, the most notable things you've just said is that you, you might actually change your own painting having looked at Richter's way of dealing with a moment, a, and in his case, a, a kind of history and a legacy. And here we are. It, it's, a mo it's a moment when the trauma of history and the inequity of humankind to other humans has become, again, a very, very urgent question that yeah. institutions like museums need to deal with properly and in the long term, actively, rather than rhetorically. And, you know, the, the idea that so many younger artists that you were referencing, particularly young women painters, such as Jordan Castile, who I have had a conversation um, with about Richter, who is a figurative painter, and so many young um, female artists are figurative painters, and how they themselves um, are thinking through how to not, not directly, but indirectly respond to this moment. It's yeah. not about depicting subject matter from this moment, but it is about using the means of paint to respond to it in the way that Richter does with the Birkenau. Yes, and, and it's it very hard to do it without A, feeling that you're cheapening or, you know, and I've made drawings and even paintings of certain events of the last few years, um, mostly unsuccessfully with the paintings. Um, but I'm so aware of this as a question of how do you talk about something that's incredibly difficult while at the same time being part of the machine that is the art world and art market, even though that's semi-involuntary on the part of the artists and something they don't necessarily control. But, you know, because who, you don't want to profit from horror and at the same time it's our day-to-day -day existence is thinking about these things um, and is it you know I'm you know for Richter to take on these subjects I mean I'm grateful that he did um, because you know silence is worse but I can see how abstraction can seem you know to make an abstract painting that's claiming to deal with a trauma could be a disaster. Um, I think that's when I used the word grand before, that there is this, it's a tragic, they're tragic paintings, tragedy paintings, and um, something incredibly hard to do 